How highly would you rate your own music? But we're not we're not very good musicians, you know, and we never claim to be very good musicians. We're, we're adequate, but not very good. Well, what's the reason, do you think, for the uh, tremendous popularity? Is it because well, people admire your talent, or...? Well, I don't know, you know, maybe they re uh, admire <coughs> adequate music. <laughs> People tend to think they met and then they were famous, but of course there were five years of hard work. Their early performances in Liverpool were quite raw, really. A lot of the gigs they weren't even paid for. They were just given drinks and things. They were regarded as a nothing group. The Beatles were about third in the running in Liverpool, and these other bands like Harry Casey and Rory Storm and the Hurricanes were really big. In Liverpool in 1661, no one had really discovered us. You know, the likes of Rory Stone and Jerry and the pacemakers would knock us into a cocktail. You know, they were the big stars and we were just like, you know, the lads on the ladder. John Lennon said, do you know what, Joe? If I don't make it with this band, he said, I'm going to get a ship and go up that river and I'll skip that ship in New York. They were just like average lads that you might meet down the football club or something, you know? Paul wants to be a window dresser. He said, don't you tell me what I want to be, Joe. I want to be a window dresser. He said, the window dressing fascinates me. Liverpool's always been a hotbed of music, but never had the recognition for it. You know, jazz, you know, steel bands, you name it, skiffle. It's all emanated there. Liverpool was a pretty bleak place. Bleak and lonely. There were black buildings, you know, and uh, certain, uh, very melancholy in a way. It was kind of biblical bleak. I mean, those storms and the light shafts cutting through and the, and the sea hitting up against that seawall. Yeah, it was pretty grim up north. The place was absolutely filthy. All these wonderful buildings that we see today were nearly all black. They had a lot of smoke coming from ships all over the place. You could go, put it for a nice white shirt on in Liverpool and you'd come home and it'd have to be washed because it'd be black smut. Towards the end of the Second World War, I mean, Liverpool was virtually flattened. I mean, there wasn't much left of it. If you stood by the Victoria Monument and looked uh, around in an arc, almost everything was flattened. How they missed the Victoria Monument, uh, God only knows. <laughs> used to play in these fields. George will be six, maybe seven. We found lots of um, unexploded stuff, grenades or incendiary whatevers. But we thought it'd be fun to blow it up because it was just there not doing anything. So we dug a hole and put this, these incendiaries into it and lit a fuse and ran away. And it just went, kaboom and just made a little hole. I was bored on the 9th of October 1940 when I believe the nasties were still booming us, led by Madolf Heathlum, who only had one. Anyway, they didn't get me. Lennon, particularly, was a kind of street urchin. He persuaded himself that he was. He wasn't, of course. He was far more sophisticated and intelligent than that. If you go to Menlove Avenue, where John Lennon spent his childhood, you will see it's an absolutely lovely area, a long, long way away from uh, a working-class hero, really. A beautiful neighbourhood with a garden front and back, a park opposite. I mean, John probably was the, the most uh, privileged of the lot. Menlove Avenue is a very nice road, living with his auntie Mimi. She was a cross between a headmistress and a librarian. In other words, intimidating. She was. She well, but I didn't want him wasting his time playing a guitar. What was I going to do if I had a boy of 21 thrown back on my hands, qualified for nothing? Did you get sent round the back door? Yeah. No, I Comes always... round the back, then. Okay. I always got in the front door. That's my claim to fame. Oh, well, well you probably dressed properly. Well, I probably had a shirt, yeah. a shirt and tie on and a suit, because, you know, yeah, you look from I was wearing... I looked like so. a scrub. She'd let the cats in through the front door, but, <laughs> but us ruffians, he's round the back. John was like uh, a naughty brother, 
who you have to keep thinking, oh God, what's he going to do next, you know. He said, I'm not young, I'm not going to do as you tell me, but he always did. <laughs> I don't think many parents liked him. They used to refer to him as that Lennon. He was a bit of a handful. He, <laughs> at, the, at the local youth club, I th I th he was blamed for burning it, setting fire to it, you know. And maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but... <laughs> the rest of them came from sort of council premises or terrace streets, you know, where there were outside loos and you had to have a bath in a tin tub. Paul McCartney lived on an estate about a mile away. Yeah, we used to rehearse in Paul's house, but I only remember his dad coming in and taking Mike out, saying, come on, leave them to it, you know. He's very strict with Paul and Mike. He sort of kept them in during the week. They were allowed out at the weekends. Because he, he was left as a lone father to bring them up. Paul was law-abiding and studious. Did his homework on time. I didn't meet his mum, apart from the fact I think she was the midwife who delivered me. George came from Wavertree area, and it was one of those small terraced houses. I don't know where they fitted them all in, though, like mother and father, George, three brothers, two brothers, and Louise all squeezed into this little council house. It was the family was crowded together, but it was quite sort of warm and nice atmosphere of those. The people of those times were really good neighbours. His dad worked on the buses, so if he ever saw you, you were waiting for a bus, he'd just pick you up and let you get on free. And George also was our butcher's delivery boy. He used to stop at my house and my mum would make him some beans on toast and a cup of tea and we'd play, listen to records. People say he was the choir people, and he was in one way because he let the other two do all the talking because they did, you know. Um, but he, he wasn't quiet, you know. He, but he was quite, very thoughtful, George. Paul and George used to get on the bus and go to school together. And George started carrying his guitar to school and sort of singing in the back of the bus. Before rock and roll and before that sort of mid 50s, late 50s period, it was dull, it, it was grey. It was monochrome in music, in films, in everything. There were no sort of British heroes. People in the earlier 50s dressed like their dads. The first sports jacket that I bought was something similar to what my father had because you wanted to look like him. I'm going to tell my Mary about my good job. He gave me half a miserable, but he has a lot of fun. The idea that you could dress the way you want only happened because of the late 50s. The start of freedom for people and um, particularly students. We wanted our own music, our own clothes, our own style. It's starting to be a bit technicolour and brighter, you know. We were so elevated in our lifestyle and our enjoyment, especially teenagers. We started getting money. You couldn't fail to be in work. The wages weren't fantastic, but we could go on a holiday, we could buy clothes, buy LPs. In the 1950s, it was very difficult to get American rhythm and blues records. Liverpool rock and roll fans were very lucky because they had the services of the Cunard Yanks. That was the name given to the men who worked on the boats that went back and forth between Liverpool and New York. They brought back the records either as gifts for people back here or it came back as ballast. My elder brother was in the Merchant Navy. He was bringing all these great records home. Not the rock and roll stuff. Earlier than that, Eddie Arnold, Johnny Cash, Billy Joe Wheeler, all these people like that. They would hear about these sometimes not very well-known rock stars, like the Coasters or the Drifters, the Do-Wop Boys, which hadn't yet established themselves. They come out of a very stagnant post-1950s idea of pop music. Um, in America, you've got the start of Soul got the start of Motown, there's a lot happening underneath the surface and those are the records that the Beatles play.
all really started off in the mid 50s when, when rock and roll and skiffle arrived pretty much at the same time. Ken Collier goes over to New Orleans, he jumps ship, he's working with the Merchant Navy and when he's there he hears all this music which is called spasm music which is basically people playing in you know houses with tin pans and with uh, you know washboards. When he comes back and he's working with Chris Barber he tells them about this form of music that he's heard about and they say what's it called? He says it's called spasm music and everyone says well you can't call it spasm music that sounds really rude and somebody and it may well have been Lonnie Donegan or maybe Chris Barber somebody comes up with the name Skiffle. Teenagers formed these groups with cheap acoustic guitars. You had a tea chest a broom handle attached to it. Somebody else would have a washboard and they would rub something up and down on that. Very primitive. I had a skiffle group in the, on the Coach Street corner with all the lads, they all had guitars. Skiffle gave us the confidence to get on stage with the bare minimum of talent. We needed three chords, we needed the guitar, no amplifiers, no PA system, and you could at least pretend to be entertainers. The origin of the Beatles was a group called the Quarrymen which John had formed at Quarry Bank School. Somebody suggested getting a band together, a group yeah. together, so John and, and Eric decided to learn guitar. They went to some guy in Hunts Cross and they realised it was going to take a year to learn to read dots, so it was too complicated. they gave up, so they went to John's mum, Julia, and she taught them banjo chords. Banjo chords, chords yeah. Most people think of only John, Paul, George and Ringo, but if you look right through the different lineups of the Beatles, starting with the Quarrymen, you'll find about 25, 26 people in there. Well, I joined a group because I, th I wanted to sing. I wanted to be a singer. I didn't particularly want to play a TGS bass, but John says, well, Bill Smith doesn't turn up for rehearsals. Do you want to come in on the TGS? That was 1955. So the, this Quarrymen, which John Lennon formed, was very much a makeshift group. If somebody just said, you know, we're having a party, do you want to come and perform? We were there, weren't we? It's perform. probably the competition. We wanted a bit of competition. No, we wanted we to stand up no, we and knew. impress the girls. Nothing to do with the competition. That's what it was all about. That girl's well, looking at me. Let's anybody. play loud. That girl's looking at me. <laughs> the Quarrymen weren't very good, as far as I remember. and then Paul McCartney joins. So we went to this uh, village fate, or we were both there together, and um, I got to know John through, through Ivan. Uh, and normally, you know, you'd be talking to people in conversation, so they watch your hobbies, or I like doing this, or like cycling, or like swimming, or... And I would say to people, I like songwriting, you know, I've written a couple of songs, and everyone would go, oh yeah, and ignore it. But John went, oh yeah, so have I. So that was like, hmm? <laughs> what, you wrote a couple songs? Yeah, so, well, show me yours and I'll show you mine, baby. <laughs> John and Paul complimented each other because they were quite different. John was the out and out rocker. He thought rock and roll was rebellion. Paul was brought up on Broadway musicals. He loved Fred Astaire, you know, uh, like Peggy Lee records and things like that. Paul did sort of smarten us up, didn't he? Paul decided he was going to buy a white jacket and wear that, so mm. John thought, well, I'm not standing in shared sleeves if Paul's wearing a white jacket, so John had to go and get a white jacket. So, wear on white shirts with black ties. Oh. John was not going to be outdone or outshone by Paul. Once Paul McCartney got in the band, they knew they wanted to do 20 Flight Rock, Eddie Cochran's song, for example. Uh, they knew they wanted to do rock and roll and that Skiffle was starting to sound a bit old hat. They knew what they wanted and they'd been, they'd been turned on by the American music of the time. The whole thing about rock and roll, when it came out, was told wrongly. It was told by the tabloids as being this outrageous thing where teenagers went mad and were uncontrolled. And it was all bollocks. It wasn't like that. I mean, Bill Haley was the first rock and roll star, but he really was a bit like a cuddly bank manager, wasn't he? So, you know, despite the fact that it was the big rage and he, he got an incredible reception, there was a slight disappointment in that it wasn't the kind of romantic thing that you wanted out of rock and roll. Um, that came with Elvis. Well, you may go to college, you may go to school, you may have a pink Cadillac, but don't you be nobody's fool, and I'll be baby, come back, baby, come Come back, baby, come. Come back, baby, I won't play high with you. 
They all heard Elvis and thought, this is different, this is what we are. Elvis Presley, Eddie Cochran, Jerry Lee Lewis, Gene Vincent, Buddy Holly and Little Richard, those were the names that the Beatles were really influenced by. On the 20th of March 1958, Buddy Honey and the Crickets are playing the Philharmonic Hall in Liverpool. So many of the people who later played in Mersey Beat groups went along to the Philharmonic Hall and they saw Buddy Holly with a Fender Stratocaster guitar. Nobody in Britain had seen a Fender Stratocaster guitar. And so they came out thinking, we want to go electric. Manchester was regarded as the capital of the North. It had Granada Television, the BBC Studios and everything. Nothing can happen unless it was done in Manchester. Liverpool was like a backwater. The cabin itself banned rock and roll. You weren't allowed to play, it was a jazz venue. Skiffle was regarded as a form of jazz and it was a jazz club, so that was acceptable. Rock and roll was taboo. John, Paul and Eric and myself we're improving quite a bit. We we're going on to much more rock and roll kind of music. And John wanted to play All Shook Up and all these rock and roll numbers. So we were mixing it on the, on the set list. Alan Sittner, who was running the cavern, he didn't want any rock and roll at the cavern. He didn't want John Lennon doing Elvis songs. Well, they took some honey. Sure enough, I was halfway through the song, a note was passed up. From a tree. Can you cut out the rock or else? Dressed it up and they're calling me. We just kept on playing. Everybody's trying to be my baby now. Nigel Wally, who was acting as our sort of manager, he got us the gigs. And they used to stand at the back and, you know, judge reactions. So the more, the more rock and roll stuff we did, the emptier this sense of area became as people just got up and was, and was disappearing. By the time we got off stage, the sense of thing was empty and John was quite devastated, so we went into the little side room. And John said, I can't believe that. He said, we ended up, there's nobody, nobody would listen to us. And Pete and, and uh, Nige burst in and, Nige, and Pete said, that was the fantastic. He said, one of the best gigs you've ever done. And John said, but they all, they all left. And Pete looked at him and puzzled him and said, no, no, he said, everybody was jiving. He said, those central eyes, he said, everyone, everyone was up dancing. John was almost myopic and couldn't really see the audience and so he used to pick the spot in the middle distance and just look at that spot and go like that. And he used to get him into a lot of trouble because he used to squint to people and somebody wanted to smack him in the face with this. Yeah. <laughs> Plus a lot of fights out. <laughs> The early gigs were quite nerve-wracking, you know, we had, as the Beatles, we had people throwing pennies at us and stuff. Ted's, you know, the big teddy boys, oh, get off, it's chucking stuff at us, you know. <clears throat> All the jazz crowd booed them and throwed coins at them, and, and they were fined, Ray McFaul fined them, but they picked the coins up, the, the, up from the floor and there was more money than they were getting paid for the gig. Picked the money up, said thank you, and they soon stopped throwing it. And when George joined, it just carried on as the quarrymen doing pretty much rock and roll music. George was the talented one. <laughs> yeah, you just nobody ever realised that. What a good guitarist George was, you know, because I mean John was a hopeless guitarist. So George started off at under mile an hour and before you knew it he was into and I, I just lost I couldn't you lost do a him. I couldn't you keep lost a beat. It just it was just a you let him carry on, right. Just let him carry on. You're the drummer. And it didn't help because Nigel was standing down the front of the stage and <laughs> he shouted out, Cole's missed the bit Cole's lost the beat <laughs> People didn't realise 
how big the musical scene was because they were all in their own areas. I mean, you'd have in the Dingle area people like Billy Fury and Billy Hatton at the foremost and Jerry Marston and Jerry and the Pacemakers. I began to make notes and I thought, this is absolutely incredible. The Iron Door came, then St. Luke's, Blair Hall, Hollyoke, Midland Town Hall, the Ancient Institute, all those venues were suddenly up and running. I wrote to the Daily Mail and newspapers saying what's happening in Liverpool is unique. It's like uh, New Orleans at the turn of the century but with rock and roll instead of jazz. But of course nobody took any notice so that's why I created the newspaper Merseybeat to promote the groups. Len disappeared. Huh. Well, I and it was disappeared. Just... I was ill. Well, you were ill. And then in 1958 we went to a recording studio in Kensington and we recorded two songs. One was Buddy Holly's That'll Be The Day and on the other side, one that uh, Paul had written called In Spite of All the Danger. We paid for it, I mean, it wasn't, you know, nobody hired us to do it. It was a small recording studio where you could go and pay a small fee. Suddenly we were walking around with a record that we could actually take home and, and play. One of the quarrymen, I think it was, they were recording as in those days, um, took that record and the Beatles never saw it again. And then Paul had to buy it back at a hugely inflated rate 25 years later. When that came out on the anthology, I got my three shillings and sixpence back, plus a bit extra. But then they stopped performing completely. They'd more or less packed in, given up. I'd had enough after a while, because there was no, we didn't have cars. I was carrying them drums on and off buses all the time. Basically, they weren't going anywhere, so I, eventually I just gave up. Some people might say, well, the first place the Beatles played and became famous was on the Cabin Club. But you've got to be honest and say, no, they played on the Casbah first. Mona Best had a little club in the basement of her house called the Casbah. John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, Stuart Sutcliffe, obviously Pete Best, since our mother owned the house where the Casbah was started, the Casbah Club, but the boys had to get involved in decorating the club, getting it ready for opening night. Um, John Lennon had three attempts at this ceiling. His first attempt, he did three-toed, pot-bellied, scrawny-like figures on it. Mo hated them. His second attempt was to paint it green, which Mo also hated. And his third attempt, which was acceptable, was John's interpretation of Aztec Mexican artwork hence the ceiling being known as the Aztec ceiling. My mother was looking for a band to open the club. She said, um, do you know anyone who might be interested? George basically turned around and said, I happen to know a couple of guys who aren't doing anything at the moment. And Mo said, you know, bring them down, you know, let's have a look at them. And they came down the next day, uh, and lo and behold, it turned out to be John Lennon and Paul McCartney. My mother put the deal to them. She said, you know, we want a residency and the band can play every Saturday. She gave them the price, which was three pound, you know, which was a lot of money in those days. This is the original stage area. This is where the lads started on the 29th of August, 1959. The lineup that night was John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison and Ken Brown who were the reformed quarrymen. That line up with the quarrymen opened the Casbah for us. No drummer, just four guitarists. Yeah, incredible. And the Casbah is always one place that people want to go because it's still like a museum. Paul McCartney painted the rainbow ceiling. And these colors for some of you may be recognizable from the Magical Mystery Tour. Paul still uses these colors today on one of his touring pianos, the one he refers to as as the magic box, but this really is where it all started. Mother and Mersey Beat wanted to bring, you know, music to the kids of Liverpool. My goodness me, she did. The Casbah became the catalyst of what the world knows today as the Mersey Beat sound. The stage area here, this is where the Beatles first played in this country, in the UK. Their first show in Liverpool as the Beatles was on the 17th of December 1960 here at the Casbah Coffee Club and this was the stage that they played on. Why are you called the Beatles? That's the name John thought of. Ringo, did you no, think of John it? Thought of it? John thought of it. John thought of it. John thought of it. There are a huge number of different versions of how the Beatles got their name. 
most groups had a lead singer. So you had groups like Cliff Richard and The Shadows, but they never wanted to be like that really. They, they were sort of Johnny and the Moon Dogs and Long John Silver and the, Long John and the Silver Beatles for a time. One venue would advertise them at the Silver Beats, but they didn't even turn up even though he'd put them as top of the bill. I suspect they were thinking of the Crickets, which was their favourite group, Buddy Holly and the Crickets. And so you can imagine crickets, insects, beetles. John insisted that the name had originally been inspired by seeing Marlon Brando in The Wild One. Lee Marvin's rival motorcycle band were allegedly called the Silver Beetles. But John said it wasn't the Silver Beetles at all. It was the girls who were with the motorcycle gang that were called the Beatles because they clung to the back of the motorcycles. John had introduced the substitution of the second E to an A, making it beat. Means. And he thought it had a kind of French kind of feel to it, Les Beatles, Les Beats. But this was just having fun really. And once they got a recording contract, they really wanted to be the Beatles. I think he got a bit of fun out of laying deliberate false information about and seeing it reproduced in the papers as fact. You know. I first met him in 1958 at Liverpool College of Art and I saw this guy come striding past. He looked like a teddy boy. I thought, that guy is different, you know? He's a bit of a rebel. I must get to know him. John was a rebel and an individual and very enigmatic. I just couldn't resist him. I knew there were easier men in the world. In fact, I was going out with a very easy, boring man at the time. But, I mean, John just, just lifted me away from all this and he was just the most outrageous character I'd ever come across. And I loved him for it. John was a great character and people wanted to sort of be around him, but not that on the wrong side of his tongue, you know. He had a cutting sense of humour, almost to the verge of being nasty. And the girls in the college used to be dead afraid of John. Uh, if they'd be talking in the corridors and he came along, they all kept quiet, afraid of what he might say to them. When he came into here in the pub, He'd sort of make sarcastic jokes about some of the old people that were in here. Maybe an old guy with a pipe or something. And, uh, and he'd start making funny, what he thought were funny remarks about him. You know, that's, that's a bad tooth you've got, Licker, with, you know, indicating that the pipe was a tooth. It was pretty good natured. Trouble is, one person's good natured remark can be taken as an insult. It was like Marmite. Some people liked him, some people didn't like him. He could be moody, you know, like us all, you know, got out the wrong side of the bed one day and you never knew what mood John was in until you started talking to him. They think your uh, haircuts are un-American. Well, it was very observant of him because we aren't American, actually. <laughs> John was a strange character. His mum was run over quite early on when he was at college. Didn't mention it to anybody. Well, there were two sides of John. There was the side that the public saw which was the caustic, abrasive, devil-may-care, you know. And the other side, which was a very tender and a very loving person. John was somewhat anxious to get away from the home environment where he was treated more like a little boy. Thus, Old building to the left is the one that we all went to as an art school in the 50s. Long time since I've been here, the Three Gambia Terrace. This is where we all shared a flat. We used to be in number three and it was called Hillary Mansions then. And uh, John Stewart, myself, Dis and Ducky had the first floor, which was one continuous big flat. A wonderful flat, three pounds a week, bog. Ah, number nine, Percy Street, where Stuart spent most of our time when we were students, along with John, Cynthia and everybody else that wanted to come to a party. First of all, we lived in the back room on the first floor. Eventually, of course, we had to move because we'd been caught burning bits of furniture that were in the basement. 
but we had a good time here and this is where they wanted a bass guitarist and we were practicing uh, in one of the rooms with the tape recorder and both Stuart and I offered to be bass guitarist. So I thought I'll make a bass guitar, carving it out of wood and I didn't have any money to get the strings but I thought well one day after I've done a bit more scaffolding work. Stuart Sutler got some money through uh, painting being purchased by uh, the John Moores family and so he got a bass guitar. He got the job, I didn't. Stuart Sutcliffe was certainly a very, very gifted artist, but he was also John Lennon's best mate and John wanted him in the group. I don't think anybody ever really saw him play with the Beatles in Liverpool. I know the person who showed him how to play, Dave May of the Madisons, and uh, he said that Stuart was a pretty competent bass player. He, he could get by, certainly. He wasn't as bad as some people say he was, but his heart wasn't really in it. We were all going to become famous, of course. We were quite sure of that. John would do it with his music, Stuart and Rod would do it with the painting, and I'd do it with my writing. We were a family, you know. We lived together for four or more years. That seemed to go quite well until the Beatles started rehearsing in the bathroom, and we started getting complaints from the agents saying that uh, there was too much noise, and noise, Beatles, noise, ridiculous. They went and auditioned for Larry Barnes. Tommy Moore was their regular drummer at that time, and they did a tour for Larry Barnes in Scotland, back in Johnny Gentle. It was a bummer, you know, it didn't happen. Tommy Moore came back from that and he said, I've had enough playing drums, I'm going back to being a forklift truck driver at Garston Bottle Works and off he put. So that left a berth for drums. Howie Case and the Seniors were the very first Liverpool group to go to Hamburg via Alan Williams, a local promoter. I came down to the club one night and there was no steel band. And uh, my waitress, Audrey, said, didn't you know they've gone to Hamburg? Well, it could have been out of Mongolia for, uh, you know. And so they wrote to me saying you should come over to Hamburg. And we went to this club called the Kaiser Keller and uh, there was an awful German band playing uh, with no rhythm, just singing. I can still hear the guy singing, Tutti Frutti, oh Rudy Tutti. And the kids were bored. So I found out with the manager, uh, who he was, and uh, I sold him the idea of having, uh, you know, bands from Liverpool. It's a little bit quieter in here. The second invasion of Germany started about four years ago. This wasn't a military invasion. Uh, but more of a pop invasion of British beat artists. Um, the club owners over here in Hamburg had been looking for a long time for something new to offer to the Hamburg youngsters. Um, all they had here was television and German television programs are usually aimed at the adults anyway. They heard from young seamen who had been in Hull, Southampton, Liverpool, such ports in Britain, on coast-to-coast -coast, uh, cargo vessels that uh, an American style of rock and roll music was being played over in Britain by British artists. Of course, it was uh, too expensive to bring American artists from the States. So these club owners, uh, people like Peter Ekon, uh, Bruno Koschmieder, decided to import British artists. Well, Bruno Koschmieder asked for another Liverpool band. So Alan Williams asked Rory Storm the Hurricanes, the most obvious ones, but they were booked to go to for a summer season at Butlins, so they couldn't do it. Then he asked uh, Jerry and the Pacemakers, but Jerry Marsden was working on the railway and he wouldn't, wouldn't give up his jobs. So in desperation, he turned to the Beatles. The Beatles had got a booking in Hamburg, but the contract stipulated that they had to have a drummer. I got a phone call from Paul. Wasn't expecting it. And he turned around and said, we've had the offer to go to Germany, Pete. Um, how would you be fixed about joining the band and playing drums? Pete was a very good looking lad. People say that Pete had the James Dean look, you know. A smashing guy. Good, solid, thumpy, loud drummer. And then lo and behold, which was the funniest thing of all, they'd seen me playing, he said, well, you've got to audition, Pete. So I landed up at the Blue Angel Club. They were all there. 
Blasted off about six numbers, which everyone knew. They went away in a corner for about 10 minutes. Alan Williams, who was the manager, was taking us out for Hamburg at that time, came in. John and Paul shouted out, this is the new drummer, Alan. You know, so Alan said, they made you audition in case you asked for more money. So I said, well, it's nice to know, but whatever they're getting suits me. Mm -hmm. Next thing was to check it out with mum and dad. When they asked Peter to join them, they weren't really known, though I had used them in my club before, they weren't really known. It's only when Peter joined them and Peter being with them as one of the Beatles, automatically I took a more personal interest in the boys. They said, it's what you're going to do, go with our blessings. So that's how I ended up and a couple of days after that we were on our way to Hamburg. Well, they took some honey from a tree, it up and they called me. And imagine um, an old dormer van. There must have been about 11 or 12 people in it. You know, there's more equipment on top of the van than what there was inside. I woke up last night, half past four, 15 women knocking at my door. Sing alongs, we nearly froze to death on the ferry going over, but that's another story it's all together. Everybody's trying to be my baby now. When we saw the Reaper plan, it was just absolutely incredible. It's just this maze of neon lights, you know, absolutely spellbinding. We'd never seen anything like it before. The red light district was pretty notorious at that time. And they were in some pretty seedy areas of Hamburg. Especially in the San Pauli area. It was gangster controlled. It was, you know, the red light district of the world at that time. But it, be, it was very violent. And it took us a while to actually recognise that. But we're from Liverpool without blowing our own trumpets. We have a reputation of being able to look after ourselves. We thought we were going to be playing the Kaiser Killer. Bruno Koschmieder was the manager. He basically turned around and said, no, 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 you're not playing here, Derry's playing here, you know. You're playing at a club further down the road. They were told, oh, you're not at the Kaiser Killer, you're at this other little club former strip club called the Indra. So we said, OK, let's go and have a look at it. So we walked down the Gross of Freiheit and away from the neon lights and the colour and the crowd. And we came to the Indra and we dashed in. Two people in there, you know, arguing over the price of a beer. And he turned around and said, you have got to make this into another Kaiser Keller. That was the challenge. And then we said, OK, where are we sleeping? So he said, over the road. First response was great, close to the club, you know. So we looked over the road and there was a cinema, the Bambi Kino, and there was a back door to it. And we went through the back door. And we went into this alleyway at the back of the cinema. Paul and I ran past what we nicknamed the Black Holes of Calcutta, which became our bedrooms, OK, which were two dungeons. And Bruno Koshmi had turned around and said, these are your quarters, you know. So we kicked up a big fuss about that. And he turned around and said, oh, it's only going to be temporary. You know, we'll change in a couple of weeks. Four months later, it was still there. It was that great big myth that was rock and roll, you know. And, you know, we were in the Sin City, so, you know, we were lads. Let's just get on and enjoy ourselves. When we went out to Germany, we were, I'll be quite honest, we were average you know, um, compared with other bands in Liverpool. But we went out to captivate the German audience six, seven hours a night, six, seven nights a week. The Beatles were very irreverent, really, and I like to look back now and think that they were the first punk group. A few times we got warned, you know, a couple of the waiters came up and, you know, the managers came up and sort of turned around and said, it's getting a little bit too risque, that's. We all decided in the break that we'd all get dressed up. And John decided that he was going to go on in the swimming trunks. And as the crowd's going wild, our antics are getting wilder and wilder and wilder. And one of us turned around and went, you won't show your backside to the German audience, right? Famous last words. Middle of a number, guitar strung round his neck. John turned around and he just flashed his backside to the audience. But he just didn't flash it. He just left it up there till the end of the song. You can just imagine that this pink derriere standing here in the face, like that, you know, not far from it. Um, and they were 
hysterical, you know. We were hysterical. John Poe face just basically pulled his trunks up again, continues the next number till the next break. But the funny thing that happened after that, the following night, they wanted that to be done again. They thought that that was going to be part of the show. So we had to explain to them, no, it was just a one-off. As far as the Beatles were concerned, I had heard about them when I first went there. Everyone was talking about them. You saw their picture up there. So you thought maybe there's something special. The crowd was growing. You know, we got the crowd to the injured and we ended up playing in the cars together on a regular basis. The German audience, more so than the British audience, liked hard driving beat music. Pete created what was called the atom beat, a way of pounding, pounding sound. We used to have to turn everything up full blast and, you know, I used to have to develop a beat which would keep everything locked together so it was a lot of bass drum work and a lot of tom-tom work. He sort of created the Beatles sound, he played the drums so loud to cover up for the sort of turned down bass sound of Stuart. And it, was, it was sort of a bit of an affectation that he was playing with his back to the audience and with sunglasses on. And it was largely so that he could see the strings and, and play. <laughs> I don't think this went down terribly well with Paul who wanted uh, professional bass players. Everyone was jealous of Stu, I'll be quite honest, because, you know, Astrid was this gorgeous German girl. One of the first letters I got from him mentioned meeting this girl who was a photographer and he was really taken with her. She walked in and she was dressed in leather. And she was a beautiful looking girl anyway. Um, but we were spellbound leather, you know. And then of course, when she, Stu fell in love with her, he started wearing leather. Um, but this was a very expensive leather. Rivalry, I suppose, you know, people could be dwelling on the fact that you punch Paul because he had a few silly things to say about Astrid one night. You know, normally Steve would just laugh it off. You know, and Astrid would just sit there and went over her head. Uh, but this particular night, Steve put his bass guitar down and turned around and punched Paul in the teeth. <laughs> and uh, that was the end of it, you know. Paul was wanting real professional musicians, and Stuart wasn't, and Stuart knew that. Stuart wanted to be an artist. And that is why he went to um, Hamburg and studied under Palazzi's Art Academy. And he went to the Top Ten Club and started playing there with Tony Sheridan. He went and told Bruno Koschmier who threatened us and said, and said, you'll never play Germany again. To which we laughed and put two fingers up and went to the Top Ten. But all of a sudden, George was alleged to be underage because there used to be an house vice over there, which meant that after nine or ten o'clock at night you couldn't perform if you were under 18 and then Paul and I uh, were framed for trying to burn the Bambikino down and we got sent home we were deported as well Stu by this time had decided he was going to stay with Astrid and John after playing with Tony Sheridan for a couple of weeks decided you know he missed the boys and he made his own way back home again The Beatles had an image that they brought back with them, which wasn't fully formed, but it had begun. Um, they, they'd got the leather jackets, which was still sort of old hat in a way, I mean, old rock and roll style. We all dashed out and got leather jackets. Because our stage clothes were basically falling to bits, okay, and it was also the idea, leather's cheap, we can wear leather on stage, off stage, basically live in it. Paul was the last, he eventually got one, but it took him quite a while afterwards. And that, for some unknown reason, became our trademark. And even when we came back to Liverpool, that was the image we brought back. The first time I saw the Beatles was on the Little and Town Hall. They'd just come back from Hamburg after being there for about six months, perhaps. And they exploded onto the stage. Suddenly they had stage presence, they had a show, they knew how to entertain, they knew how to engage with the audience. You know, people were flabbergasted. Uh, they didn't know how to take us. The first time they played with them was St John's Hall Doodle. I came home from work and I bought the Echo to see who was on with us tonight. 
And it was a, from Hamburg, the Silver Beatles. I thought, who the hell are they, you know? So, and I watched them, they were fantastic. Other groups were sort of came on, were in suits and played and didn't communicate with the audience as much as they did. In Britain at that time, it was uh, pretty pop stars in shiny suits, uh, choreographed shadows walking and uh, nice bright guitars. They were just you know, actually smoking on stage. They had their amps on chairs. At one point, um, they were talking all German on stage because they could speak fluent German. People thought they were a German band direct from Hamburg and thought, oh, they don't all speak uh, good English for, um, for Germans, you know? Just the clothes convinced us that they were German. We were wearing leather jackets, we were wearing polo necks, we had cowboy boots. Um, our hair had grown long. We were wearing, at that time, you may laugh, red v-neck jumpers. <laughs> so uh, we thought, oh, I think we better look at ourselves here. And we did, we just took note of the Beatles. Never seen so many kids start to dress in leather jackets in Liverpool after that. Of course, the music we were playing as well behind there. You know, the two and two went hand in hand together. A raw energy, savage band that we were, a great rock and roll band. And the audience that were dancing actually stopped and walked towards the stage and watched them. And we thought, this is something special here. The Beatles suddenly appeared in Liverpool and I thought, I'll go and see them. I get on the bus and there's George sitting with the guitar. And I'm gonna, <laughs> he's doing the gig, so can I carry a guitar to get him free? And suddenly turns out he is this new group, the Beatles. So I just carried on carrying his guitar until John and Paul said, you can carry ours as well. And then one day, you know, Brian Epstein had become their manager. You know, they didn't pay me to do it. He said, who are you? I'm going to be paid to go and see the Beatles free. We flew over to Germany. We were opening the Star Club and we were met when we were coming off the plane on the tarmac uh, by Astrid. And we all turned around and said, where's you?" And she turned around and said, don't you know? And we said, no. And she said, Stu died of a brain hemorrhage. That was the first time I've ever seen John cry in public. Broke down, tears cascaded down his face, and you know, I think that was, that's how everyone felt. You know, it was such a shock. We weren't expecting it because, you know, he was no longer part of the band, but he was still with us in spirit. Every time he played over there, he'd turn up, he'd watch us. He still loved being part of it, being associated with it. Um, so his demise, you know, um, was a big shock to everyone. I don't think John and I ever spoke about the fact that Stuart had died. I think it was a close book to John, he just didn't want to think about it, because they really were very close. Anyone who didn't enjoy the stuff of Hamburg must have missed something. We were earning what was a small fortune in Britain. And I bought my very first car from my first month's stay at the Star Club. That's how good it was. You mixed with all the musos, and so you played with Gene Vincent, Jerry Lee, Ray Charles, Fats Domino, the Everleys, Joey D. You played with all these people, so you're learning all the time. It was a great school. No one in Great Britain outside Liverpool knew who the Beatles, who King Size Tony, totally, The Undertakers, the big three, one of the best bands, or Jerry and the Pacemakers, completely unknown. And suddenly we realised there was a force there. All together, off of the pool, it was manic. But depending on where your lineup was in the routine of the club, you could do two hours, three hours, or if you went on very early in the afternoon, you would find yourself doing a very early morning spot as well. So you could do four hours in a the night there. John and I were the ones who, you know, we'd prop the bars up and we'd talk about, you know, home and all the other bits and pieces. Normally you'd be walking home in daylight, early hours of the morning, and you'd either go down to the Siemens Mission by the, the, the port and get your chips and egg or your steak, and then you'd go home to bed, sleep most of the afternoon. Bert Kempford, who's one of the biggest impresarios in the German record industry, came in under the radar, very low profile. But we got tipped off when he was there and we put on the show of our lives. 
he fell in love with us. And of course, Pistry Ports Razor now, you know, he signed us up and Tony Sheridan. The Beatles' first chart entry was a record they made with Tony Sheridan of My Bonnie. And they made that in Hamburg in 1961, and that got to number 31 on the German charts. So that was the Beatles' first hit single. Germany allowed them to express themselves. They, they did do the most outrageous things on stage. I mean, John Lennon making Nazi salutes and swearing all the time, but partly because there was a language problem. And he thought it was quite funny to do, you know, call them Nazis and the Heil Hitler sign and all the other bits and pieces. They loved it. You know, half of them didn't know what he was talking about anyway. John could have been a stand-up comedian. He was funny. And people, people forget this about John. He was a funny guy. John, despite all his bravado and all his bluff, was as insecure as anyone else. And his way of dealing with, with that was to get the boot in first before anyone else could. I was going into the Star Club. John Lennon was coming out. We hadn't met at that point, so I introduced myself and said I really enjoyed the show last night. So he kind of, yeah, yeah, Frank, isn't it? Yeah. And he, uh, he looked at me like, I suppose, a snake before it eats a rabbit. And he said, yeah, I've been talking to, I enjoyed your show as well. Uh, I've been talking to people in the club and it seems uh, that next to Cliff in the band, you're the most popular member. I can't think why, your harmonies are bloody ridiculous. And he didn't say bloody. Um, so uh, I, I stood there thinking, I don't know if I've been insulted here or whether this is some kind of joke and I'm not quite getting the humour. A bit snide, a bit, a bit cruel sometimes. Because he couldn't walk away from a good joke. If, if he saw something funny to say, he'd say it. You know, they, they thought, well, maybe, maybe I shouldn't have said that. You know. I admired him as a person. I admired him as a musician. I had such great times with him, great memories of him. He was my hero. Yeah, that's, I suppose that's the best way of putting it. The Beatles had a very strong following that, that they engineered in Hamburg. I mean, when they came back, they played to that audience. I mean, the Cavern Club was pretty notorious for having a very strong female contingent there. It was girls with curlers in their hair and, and a scarf over on the top, you know. It was very small time. I lived in the cavern. Every time they were on, I was there. It was the only club in Liverpool that done lunchtime sessions. You could go to hear music in your dinner hour. The cavern was a strange place, you know. You'd been there, it's a filthy hovel. It was a black door in the street and a bouncer leaning against the door. Paddy, and you went down one flight of stone stairs into this cellar. To these little vaulted rooms where people stood like sheep in a cattle train, you know. Get your gear down the cavern when it's packed. So it, it was hard, but we were young and we enjoyed it. Health and safety wouldn't have even allowed people to go into it nowadays. Hot, sweaty, smelly, with water running down the walls. At least we hope it was water. There's clouds of smoke mingling with the perspiration on the wall. And smelt. <laughs> smelt of death. <laughs> Couldn't deny that you, you'd been to the cavern because you'd, you'd have a smell on your clothes. Um, and it was a unique smell. I know some people say it was a, you know, all because of urine and things like that. If it wasn't smelling of cabbage, it was smelling of some disgusting... <laughs> Dettle that they were throwing around the toilets See, at the time. That's just a nice <laughs> picture, yeah, that's a nice picture. <laughs> but it was blended in with, because there was a fruit marker's opposite. So, you know, you had the smell of orange, and um, it, I'm sure if I could bottle it, I could make a fortune. But of course it was the show place for a lot of Liverpool bands, and the atmosphere in there, when it was packed, was electric. Everybody was standing in the same few square yards, right in front of the stage, just looking up at them. If you ever look at any of the old photos, it wasn't the best of equipment, you know, apart from the drum kit, that was great. They only had two microphones, so George would be on this side of the mic and Paul on the other side of the mic, sharing the microphone, not because they thought that was a clever thing to do. They couldn't afford another microphone. When you talk to people who went to the cavern, Frida Kelly, for instance, she said how it was great because you could talk to them and shout at them and shout out requests, you know, sing money, John, you know, you know, taste a honey pull. 
they were so funny with each other and oh, it was just magic. And they'd shout back, like you heard of, take the colours out next time. I defy anybody that went down and saw the Beatles at the cavern to come out saying, I don't like the Beatles. You couldn't possibly say that. They were all popular, but Pete was the one. And the girls used to just stand and look at Pete and even chant, you know, at the, after the end of songs. Fans would sleep outside Mona Best's home to just be near Pete Best. I mean, he had that kind of following early on, which really none of the other Beatles had quite to that degree. At the time on the Mersey Beach scene, bands weren't doing their own songs. If you were on last, all the other groups had probably done all your best songs. Paul said to John, John, we've got to have our own stuff, otherwise we'll never get anywhere. They would take a song that they loved and then write a song that was somewhat similar to it. I mean, if you listen to an early B-side like this boy, the song itself isn't very far removed from what the Shirelles were doing. A song like Soldier Boy, for example. They would churn out songs every 20 minutes, you know, like machines. So if they didn't finish the song in 20 minutes, they threw it away and started on another one. You know, you'd be in the coach on tour and they would write enough songs for an album, you know, in between Sunderland and Doncaster. When uh, the Beatles started performing their own songs, like One After 909, uh, in large situations, no other groups uh, have written their own songs. They'd do a Chuck Berry thing or whatever, and then suddenly they'd say, we're going to do one of our own now. You know, people were sort of, oh, well, do, do we have to sing? Do you have to sing that one? Why can't you do another Chuck Berry? John would lie on the carpet in front of the fire, on his stomach, with his legs like that at the back, beating out whatever was in his mind. And he'd write maybe three or four lines. He'd go, ah, crumple it up, throw it on the floor. There was about 30 or 40 pieces of paper all crumpled up. And I threw them on the back of the fire. And then 20 years into his death, I was sitting here. And on the television news, six o'clock, it said, today in London at Sotheby's, a piece of paper with part of a John Lennon lyric sold for £40,000. And I went, oh my God, how many pieces of paper did I throw on that fire? <laughs> the Beatles were getting a bit fed up. They wanted to break out of Liverpool. They were still playing the cavern to crowds, but a bit static, nothing was happening. And then Brian Epstein came on the scene. Well, everybody knew he was, because he was the manager of the biggest record shop. He had very good ears for a hit single. Of course, he had that ability to listen to a record that was being plugged by buyers when they came into the shop and say, that one's a hit, that isn't a hit. Brian was telling me he was interested in this band that was playing at the Cavern, and he did ask me to go and listen to them. And I sat on the steps halfway down. I listened to them playing Hey Babe. And I went back and he said, what do you think? I said, if you don't take them, somebody will come along and take them. And he looked at me and said, such as yourself? I said, possible. I said, they're very good. Brian was mesmerized by us when he first saw us on stage. You know, whether it was the leathers, our attributes, whatever, you know, he fell in love with. Brian came from an upper middle class, Liverpool Jewish background. They were respectability in Liverpool personified. A very, a very gentle man, very uh, clever man, middle class at point. And he was like coming down to all these working class lads. The Beatles always came to my house because John, uh, Brian's mum wouldn't agree to four lads in denims and so there was no Beatles allowed in that home. What you've got to give Brian credit for was he was the one who took the gamble with these five uncut diamonds. After Brian's death, when I talked to his mother, Queenie, it was clear that she still couldn't reconcile herself with the fact that their son had kind of slummed it with these people. <laughs> Brian said, Joe, I can't go around pubs and clubs and ask for bookings for a band, can I? He said, would you stand in, come with me and uh, be their booking manager? The big difference with Brian Epstein is that he was someone with vision. Brown was the only person who could see over the Mersey. 
Brian was a fantastic promoter. Um, not, a good, not a great businessman, not, didn't do great deals, but he gave them his, his soul. His strength, as well as his weakness, was his adulation for the band. It was almost obsessive. The Beatles fulfilled a need in him. He, I think he was very restless. He had a low boredom threshold and they provide an outlet for his showbiz theatrical ambitions. Because he wanted to be a star himself. He was like a frustrated star, or an actor, an actor, he used to say. These boys are going to be bigger than Elvis. That was his classic line. All the time he used it before he'd even had a record out, you know. And he believed it. He sincerely believed it. The simple fact was, his vision was very clear. They were going to be big, and he was going to help them. London controlled the entire music industry. Apart from Mersby, every major music paper was down there. All the national press was down there. All the agents, managers. And up to then, you had to go down to London to make it. The Beatles were very ambitious. They wanted to make it, whatever it took. John knew it was a game. He was prepared to do anything within limits in order to become successful. He knew that Brian knew how the game was played. He had to change the Beatles into a group that would be acceptable to the people in the media, to the radio and TV people. The establishment were cigar-smoking successful, usually Jewish businessmen. And they were not going to put up with a bunch of long-haired louts coming into their office smoking, swearing, wearing leather jackets. He put them in mohair suits by his own tailor, Ben O'Dorn. He took them to Horn Brothers to have their hair cut. Epstein wasn't a totally controlling manager. You know, he talked to them about it. I've never directed that the boys should do anything, either sort of song-wise, uh, artistically-wise, or um, speech-wise. Uh, they, they, we all make up our minds. And I contribute, I suppose, a fifth. I understand where Brian Epstein was coming from. Wrong word, but he probably cleaned them up because they didn't smoke on stage and they had to be on time and they had to bow if it was a theatre. And you know, but I liked the wildness. You know. It was a foot in the door method to get across to people that these were not just roughnecks but talented individuals. And that's what Epstein did for them. Otherwise, they'd have never got the stage in the first place. Brian worked hard to promote the Beatles to get the deal. You know, he tried to trundle around London. People were ignoring him. People said to me, they'll make a mincemeat of him in London. But they, they won't get anything. You needed a record. A record was everything. It was, it was like the holy grail, get a record. Brian hawked the tapes around London, basically every record studio. Went to Phillips, went, went to Polydor, went to everybody. Nobody wanted them. In desperation, Brian had taken tapes to Tony Meehan, who was the Shadows drummer, who at that time was working as an A&R man for Dick Rowe. I recall Brian collared him at some press reception and said, Tony, have you had a chance to listen to those tapes yet by the Beatles? And Tony Meehan said, I'm a very busy man, Mr. Epstein. I think Tony Meehan was about 19 at the time, but anyway. Biggest turn down was Decker. Poor old Dick Rowe always gets it in the neck for being the man who turned down the Beatles at Decca Records. Dick Rowe recorded the Beatles down in London, and Epstein chose which songs to sing. Things like The Sheik of Araby, which was totally wrong. Hello Little Girl was okay, but you know, Besame me mucho. If you listen to the demos, a lot of them aren't particularly good. It's New Year's Day, everybody's a bit hungover, they've had a horrendous drive. Um, it's a bit flat. As John would say later, he said, he was right to turn us down, we were awful. <laughs> I might have turned those tapes down myself. We thought we were going to get signed by Decca, but we, we didn't. Um, Brian Poole and the Tremolos did. History has judged Dick Rowe very harshly, but he did sign the Rolling Stones, so he recouped fairly quickly. It wasn't just Dick Rowe. It was uh, right across the border. EMI, Pi, 
they all turned down those tapes. And it was only by sheer luck that Brian Epstein persisted and took those tapes back to EMI when he heard that George Martin had been away on holiday when he'd made his rounds previously and he was somebody he hadn't tackled. Be quite honest about it. Um, most probably EMI was one of the last studios that he managed to get a deal with. They went down for an audition and it was Ron Richard, who was from Parlophone Records, the A&R man, who were recording them. The engineer thought it was good and he went down to the canteen and brought George Martin up and then George Martin took over. We were very blasé about it. Um, you know, um, it was the first time we'd really been in a proper recording studio. In Hamburg we recorded on stage in a school hall and all the other bits and pieces. So seeing a proper recording studio, EMI, people that were there were quite clinical. George Martin never appeared without a collar and a tie and rather kind of dapper suit and spoke in a frightfully posh voice. And, you know, they thought he was the bee's knees. We, we decided on what we were going to play. And after that was in the lap of the gods, you know, whether we got signed or we didn't. George Martin, who was skating on thin ice at the time and likely to have left the company anyway, decided he'd take a chance. The way in which they were signed to EMI was quite tortuous. And George Martin had his doubts. In June 1962, the Beatles went down to Parlophone uh, and were recorded by George Martin and did a version of Love Me Do. And if you hear that version of Love Me Do, for whatever reason, Pete Best sounds like he's banging a couple of bin lids on that record. He just had an off day. And George Martin said, we've got to use a, a session drummer when we do this song again. They could only think about, we've got one chance with a record in, in London. That's it, you know. And so I think that made the others think, well, this is time for him to go. My departure from the band, no. There was no inkling at all, whatsoever. Um, you know, that's still a mystery today. It was terrible what happened to him, you know. You know you, I mean, poor Pete, to be told on the brink of the first recording that you're out. Now, there have been so many excuses, but uh, we've had no actual reason as to why Peter should leave. As I say, success mm. is hard to come by and these things do happen. But it's just the way that it was done that has annoyed us. What do they say mainly? Well, you know, the drummer wasn't too good, the beat wasn't so hot. You know. The reason I was given I wasn't a good enough drummer. <laughs> people who saw me play then and people who've seen me play since then have turned around and said, no, that wasn't the decision. If you listen to his early drummer or hear any of his stuff, he's just as adequate a drummer as Ringo, if not better. Then that, that opens up the enclave into what the decision was. And then you got all the other bits, jealousy, hairstyle, blah, 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 it goes on. Um, so I suppose the biggest myth is, right, not, inf not influencing it, it's a public decision, that's why I turn around and say, right, I'm not a bad drummer, okay, let the people make their own mind up about that. I think maybe the drumming was used as an excuse to get rid of him. Unfairly. Clash of personalities, well, probably that may be it, because it, Peter was... Uh, did have a terrific fan club, you know, yeah. compared to the others. It's too so, good looking, perhaps, eh? Well, I'll leave that for the other people to say, but if it had done, been done a bit more straightforward, it would have been more to the mark. We had a lot of trouble with Pete's mother, uh, Mona Best. She was constantly ringing up Brian Epstein and saying, what are you going to do for Pete's band? And Brian Epstein didn't like that at all. Brian phoned me and said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to let the band go. He said, uh, maybe you'd be interested. I said, why? He said, I can't get over Mrs. Best. He said, she's just, you know, overpowering. So we had discussed that it might be better to get rid of Mrs. Best by getting rid of Pete. It's a bit like that uh, Agatha Christie book, Murder on the Orient Express, where all these people have different grudges against this person. All the people involved around Pete Best had a reason for wanting Pete Best to leave the band. He looked great and he was a great drummer, a lovely man, but he just was not 
didn't have the same humour as the other three, or the same way of life. You can't change your personality. Peter, very quiet. You know, I liked Peter, but... Um... He was different, and that probably didn't work too well when you were away a long time together and stuck together. We'd drive back from Newcastle, and he'd go home, but we'd still go finish the night off somewhere. You know. The other three were so outgoing, and I think they needed somebody outgoing. Yeah. I see the Beatles as being essentially pragmatic. Once they'd been grounded and focused by Epstein, they had a collective ambition, and anything that stood in the way of that ambition would be sacrificed, and I'm afraid I think Peter, Pete Best was. But, uh, the way I look at it, you know, just let it lie now. Except what? for the reports in the papers, and that, you know, it gets me a bit niggled at times. I mean, what is interesting is, is that the Mersey beat that comes out um, following Pete Best's sacking says that Pete Best left the band by mutual agreement. I think Bill Harry was fed that by Brian Epstein as a press release, and it was obviously completely wrong. When Pete was fired, I mean, there was a huge outcry amongst the fan club. It was taboo, it was really upsetting people. Uh, nobody wanted Pete to leave the Beatles. The reaction from people in Liverpool was absolutely incredible. There was demonstrations, a, a march to the city, bring back Pete. You know, there were riots in Matthew Street, posters, Ringo never Pete forever. And George got punched in the face. There was lots of trouble. Even Ringo Starr was threatened. I used to be good mates with Ringo. Well, you know, before the replacement took place. We're still mates now, like, but yeah. I haven't seen him to have a chat with him or anything like that. It was very heartwarming for myself, um, seeing the support I had. Um, but deep down inside, I knew that the decision had been made, you know, and regardless of what happened, you know, the door wasn't going to be opened again. Ringo had played with the Beatles on occasions when Pete Best had been ill. So they knew they could get on well with him. He fitted into the band more perfectly as a person now, I think. He tried to fit in. He sitting chatting and having a toasted cheese sandwich and a scotch and coke, you know. And we, we, everyone became very fond of him. I would class Ringo as the happy Beatle. You know, he was always dancing and singing along with different songs or humming a song, you know. I've always said Ringo was a very lucky person. And I was sitting here in this room one night with Paul McCartney, and I said, there's one lucky person, isn't there, Paul? And he said, don't go down there, Joe. He said, leave him alone. Ringo had a, a pretty sad childhood in the early 1990s. He was back in Liverpool and he was remembering the places that he, he knew in Liverpool. And invariably he goes to hospitals. Did you enjoy your stay in hospital? Oh, it was nice, thanks. How, How, did, did, you get on? How did you get on with the nurses? Not so bad, you know. Very nice nurses. Were, you a, model, were you a model patient, do you better ask the nurses about that. <laughs> what did you dislike about being in hospital? Um, nothing really, because I had to go in. So, you know, I just sort of settled down and read and played records and got used to it again. He was in hospitals so many times, and not at school, that the kids used to call him Lazarus. At the end of school, you had to have a, a signed report saying, you know, you've been a student at the school, and the teachers didn't even know who he was. I knew his mum and his stepdad. They, Elsie was lovely, she'd always give you a cup of tea. Mrs Bravestock, does Ringo want to move house? I don't really think so. He's asked us to have another house, but we're quite happy here. Has Ringo suggested you should stop work as a Liverpool Corporation painter? He certainly has, but I don't want to move. I like my job and I like the people I work with. Ringo, he was like the final piece in the jigsaw, you know, of Beetledom. It's that indefinable element. You just know when something works and something doesn't. And in particular with music, where it is so much to do with feel and instinct, that's very important. They eventually got a recording contract to make the first sort of record. Brian came home to Lime Street and we were all waiting there for him and it was like the Prime Minister who was waving the paper at the beginning of the war. He said, success, success.
George Martin didn't think they were going to be this fantastic band. He gave them a tiny royalty and, you know, thought, well, we'll try them, you know. Eventually they came out with the number Love Me Do, but it didn't have much impact in the music paper chart. In those days, you could buy your way into the charts and Love Me Do wasn't doing too well. So we ordered 10,000 to help us along. Brian bought them, stocked the shops and sold them. It's, <laughs> he was a record retailer first and foremost. So of course we went to number one in Merseybees. It was our number. We were the only people to have that record as a number one record. People didn't believe that Liverpool was selling all these records, but they were. The impact it had on kids around the country was sort of tremendous. It was something different, something new. I got shivers down my spine when I heard them singing on the radio and I thought, this is ridiculous. I've seen these guys playing so many times and now they're on the wireless. I could see that something was going to happen. And please, please, we went to number one, the second one, and you knew something was going to happen. Suddenly there's John, Paul and George, and I thought, what the bloody hell are they doing on the telly? <laughs> And that was it. And uh, after that, you couldn't pick up a newspaper without having the hair cut. Now, Rigo, I hear you were manhandled at the Embassy Ball. Is it? What happened exactly? I don't know. I was just talking, having an interest like I am now. But if I was talking away. There you go. I just looked down and you just saw all the faces. Well, he got the usual, didn't he? You know, or can I have pieces of hair? And um, which, in the beginning, I, I thought was a bit odd. So in the end, I thought, you know what, I can do this. So I went over to the hairdressers, because it was only over the road from where we worked. And I just picked the hair up, put it in an envelope, and I would write on the envelope who, whose hair it was. So I, would, I didn't get it mixed up. So there's a lot of hair out there. The phone Brian said, can we have the Beatles for a photo session? And Brian's answer was, yes, if you send a limo to the Westmoreland Hotel. I said, we don't send limos for Cliff Richard or oh, Prisley. And Brian said, these boys are going to be bigger than Elvis Presley, never mind Cliff Richard. So, <laughs> we sent a limo. Yeah, I could not believe that the Beatles that I was seeing in the cavern were actually on our biggest theatre in Liverpool. To me, that, that was it, they were famous. And I think that was the point where I thought, Oh dear, I think that I should have finished that guitar. <laughs> Missed out here. <laughs> Did you deliberately try and create this sort of screaming reaction? No, we just, you know, arrive at the theatre and they're always there waiting. <laughs> and whenever we're doing a show, the police always come and say, don't look out the window, you know, because you're excited. <laughs> If you're going to be a star, Liverpool wasn't big enough. They had to move down to London, you know, it was inevitable. And people did feel left behind, that there was some animosity, but it had to happen. But the Beatles were always very aware of their roots. They didn't sort of say, we're off now. They said, come with us, we're going to be, want our pals all around us. The pals would keep them, keep them real. You use the word joy about the best moments of it. That's a very strong word, joy. Was it that much fun? Oh, yes. It's just something that went on and on and on and got better and better and bigger and bigger. And being in the centre of it, you just got swept along. There was always like that idea, oh, it's all going to stop tomorrow. <laughs> it never did. Anthology One, when it was released in 1995, had I think 12 tracks featuring Pete Best, and that the worldwide sales of it were over 13 million. Out of the blue, we got a phone call from Paul McCartney. Paul was honourable and gave Pete what he was due. My life since then has been absolutely incredible. You know, I've still got a great band which tours the world. They do a lot of Beatles songs. And I asked him why I wanted to say, well, because they're bloody good songs. You know, why wouldn't you? I'm still alive, still healthy, still go for a pint, still enjoying myself, um, got a great family. You know, wife I've been married to for 50 odd years, daughters, grandchildren. 
I've had a wonderful life. I hope it continues. You remember being part of a huge revolution that changed the music of the world. The Beatles turned the whole recording scene upside down. They were, as Brian Epstein memorably said, bigger than Elvis. They were four Elvises. They were that big. Every day with the Beatles, it was a joy, a laugh and an adventure. <laughs>